Howdy folks, welcome to another episode of the Rifle Chair Channel. This, uh, this is a video that I've, I've been thinking about for a little while, and I'm not sure how it's going to roll out. But I think for many of you urban and rural people out there, um, you might see something in this that touches you a little bit. I think mostly rural people will, will groove on this though. So I'm, I'm dedicating this, uh, this video, I'm, I'm calling it Jed's Rifle. Now, who's Jed? Let's go back in time to 1984. In 1984, uh, a movie came out called Red Dawn, and it uh, it starred Patrick Swayze. It was Charlie Sheen. They played brothers, Matt Eckert and Jed Eckhart. Um, it starred uh, Leah Thompson, who played uh, Erica Mason, and C. Thomas Howell. Just a fantastic cast. I mean, all young movie actors at that time who would eventually their careers would blossom and take them in all kinds of different directions. However, I think for a lot of those young actors, even some of the, the older actors, is that this was a foundational movie for them that really kind of gave them the momentum and t took their careers in, in, a, in a positive direction. Um, this, uh, it was directed by John Milius, and the screenplay was by uh, Kevin Reynolds. Let's do a quick check here for you. I'll show you a little bit more about this rifle here. It, it's, it's on this theme. So I'll give you a general plot of the movie. If some, you, I think most of you know about Red Dawn, but I'll just, I'll just read you a brief paragraph here. Um, on a September morning in the small town of Calumet, Colorado, a local high school teacher pauses when he sees Soviet paratroopers landing in a, near, in a nearby field. The paratroopers open fire when the teacher confronts them. Pandemonium follows as students flee amid heavy gunfire. In downtown Calumet, uh, Cuban and Soviet troops are trying to impose order after a hasty occupation. Cuban Colonel Bella instructs the KGB to go to a local sporting goods store and obtain the records of the, st of the store's gun sales on the ATF's Form 4473, which lists citizens who have purchased firearms. They want to track down those citizens. Brothers Jed and Matt Eckert, along with their friends Robert, Danny, Daryl, and Ardvark, flee into the wilderness after hastily equipping themselves at the sporting goods store owned by Robert's father, Mr. Morris. Now, this is the same sporting goods store the KGB is going for. Right there. While on the way to the mountains, they run into a Soviet roadblock, but are saved by an attacking U.S. Army UH-1 helicopter gunship. After several weeks in the forest, they sneak back into town. Jed and Matt learn that their father is being held in a re-education camp. They visit the site and speak to him through the fence. Mr. Eckert orders his sons to avenge his inevitable death. The kids visit the Masons and learn that they are behind enemy lines in occupied America. Robert's father is revealed to have been executed because of the missing inventory from his store. Because the boys took those, took some rifles. We'll get into that. The Masons charge Jed and Matt with taking care of their two granddaughters, Tony and Erica. After killing Soviet soldiers in the woods, the youths begin an armed resistance against the occupation forces, calling themselves Wolverines after their high school mascot. We'll just stop there. If you haven't seen the movie, the I think it's the mid-80s, 1984, sometime around there, Red Dawn. If you haven't seen that movie, stop this, stop this video right now and go watch it, then come back. Now, the rest of you, I'm assuming you've seen the movie. That's the basic plot of it. So let's go back to Mr. Morris's sporting goods store for a second. They come racing in in that beautiful 1970s step-side Chevy uh, half-ton pickup truck. Beautiful truck. I love it. Wish I had one like that. It <laughs> would be great. So when they... Mr. Morris loads them up with sleeping bags, food, a football, um, 
Shelters, compound bow, hunting arrows, 12 gauge shotgun, a Marlin, a Marlin Model 336 and 3030, and a Ruger Model 77 Ultralight with a 1 to 4 by 20 Leopold scope. I'm pretty sure it's Leopold, it might be a Redfield. One of those uh, late 70s, early 80s uh, hunting scopes. And uh, he also gave them all of the ammunition that they could carry in that pickup truck. I mean, we're talking a hasty, get the stuff and go, right? I'll find, I'll find you soon enough was the last words out of Mr. Morris's mouth. Well, he never made it. So the thing is that Mr. Morris, he may have had a rack full of AR-15s, SKSs, Kalashnikovs, maybe even FNs. Who knows? He's probably got a rack full of all the, all the fun guns. But that's not what he gave them. That's not what he sent them off with, is it? A Marlin 336 or an, an M77 and 308 and that 12 gauge shotgun. You know, there's a there's a few reasons why I think you know he he gave them those particular family of firearms. Um, first of all, let's kind of look at the people themselves. They um, they were no doubt friends of the family, the Morris and the Eckerts, Mr. Morris and Mr. Eckert. We're talking small town dynamics. Right? They no doubt knew one another. Now, Mr. Morris knew that Mr. Eckert's sons, Jed and Matt, they're hunters, the rural kids. The reputation. Reputation is everything. So, why did Mr. Morris give them those firearms? Number one, familiarization. Okay, uh, these were, these were, um, these were young men that were taught hunting by their dad. They were familiar with bolt action rifles. They were familiar with lever action rifles. They were already familiar with shotguns. Um, they had rural fathers. That, that's a key piece right there. Because we're, we're also talking about the urban rural divide. We don't understand the people in the cities and the people in the cities, they don't understand us. You've got a huge culture gap there. The rural urban divide. They had rural fathers, these boys. Uh, they were probably community-oriented people as well, small towns. Everybody kind of knows one another to a certain extent. Um, they're probably, you know, rod and gun club members, for example. They probably uh, donate their time for, for important community, you know, programs. Um, rural fathers, grandfathers important kind of role models and the lives of young men, hard-working young men, hard-working people. Integrity, responsibility, trust, sacrifice, leadership, personal honor, uh, all of these kinds of things, while under a modicum of stress. Now let's look at uh, Let's look at it maybe to a different level. So now Mr. Morris gives them these firearms, these bolt action, lever actions, and 12-gauge shotgun, because he knew he knew that they knew how to use it already. Familiarization. Now you're going to be out doing anything under a modicum of stress. You need to have established familiarization before you can really have <coughs> um, competent people doing a competent job. Jed Eckert used to be the cap or the captain or the um, the uh, quarterback of the uh, of the local high school's football team. In fact, both brothers are deep into the into football. They're immersed in that game. That, you know, that sport. What is football? Football is tactics. Football is strategy. And doing all of these things under Severe physical stress. Severe physical stress and, to a certain level, mental stress. So he knew how to communicate tactics. Uh, he knew how to communicate plays um, to the people around him on his team. And 
He knew how to communicate these things quickly, effectively, and he knew that, that meant practice, developing a system that, that they could all operate within. And he also knew how to motivate. He knew how, he knew how to lift his team members when they were down. Motivate them. That's the mental part, right? He knew how to lead. He knew how to use tactics. He had these competencies. He was the obvious leader of that group, was Jed. Jed's rifle, the Ruger M77 Ultralight, was not the Mark II model. This here is a Winchester Model 70. You guys already know that. This uh, Ruger M Model 70 is in 308, manufactured in 1958. In many ways, this rifle is similar to the philosophy of use that the Ruger M77 featherweight was manufactured for. <clears throat> A bolt action rifle that was manufactured to be reliable, robust, and to be handed down to generations. We're talking generations of people that have handed this rifle down. This rifle is 61 years old. And uh, it's fantastic. And a cartridge and a caliber that is commonly available in any rural location. In many ways, this Model 70 Featherweight in 308 is similar to the Ruger M77 Ultralight that Jed was using in that movie. I mean, it's even got a similar scope on the rifle. This here is the uh, the low pulled 1 to 4 by 20 1 inch main tube with uh, mill turrets for uh, elevation and windage. This is standard duplex reticle. Um, that is the the optic I've chosen to run on on this on this rifle. It's an area shooting rifle not necessarily a precision shooting rifle. However Reliable, robust, 61 years old, and still still in the field, boys, boys and girls. That's, that's got to say something for the rifle. Now, the, the boys were, they had the familiarization to be able to run these, these rifles efficiently, and not only that, they were training the, uh, the other kids around them. Safe handling drills, you know, all, all these different kind of things, the fundamentals of precision and marksmanship. Um, they did eventually have to put the, the hunting firearms aside in favor of um, mil military weapons that the enemy was using. No doubt have something to do with ammunition supply, sustainability, resupply. Um, however, they used these, these firearms to survive. And in this movie, they did it quite well. I think they represented it quite well. They, those firearms got them through the winter, right? They were surviving, surviving in austere elements. And after that first winter, there's, there's no doubt that they wanted to go home. They said, do we really need to be out here? Can we go home now, right? These are kids. They want their mommies and their daddies. So I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, Rifle Chair, Red Dawn is a movie. <laughs> I know it's a movie. But, much of the story is based on a lot of historical truths. Uh, kind of the savagery of human beings once they're ideologically driven. Now, wars are frequently actually fought by civilians. I mean, just look at this rifle. Okay. This is a Yugoslavian Model 70 Mauser, an 8x57. Okay. It's a hunting rifle. It was manufactured as a hunting rifle. And that was during the Yugoslavian Civil War. 
these were relatively accurate rifles in comparison to what was commonly available to most people. So they're, these are not built to be precision firearms. They're hunting rifles, but they're still more accurate than a Kalashnikov. So, you know, many of them would use something like this. That was a military war. It was a military civil war. Frequently, there are civilians in the mix. Okay, they're in that environment. They have to fight back. Red Dawn, kind of the same kind of idea, right? It's a, it's a movie, but it's based on, I would say, historically accurate kind of norms. In those horrible environments. Now, North America today is not a military war. But the same old elements are still at play. In North America today, there is an ideologically driven war. I got a windstorm outside, sorry about that. We are in an, an ideologically driven war in Canada and the United States. What do I mean by that? Well, today's enemy, today's Marxists, today's communists, they call themselves socialists and liberals. Today's communists, today's Marxists, today's neoliberals, socialists. Let's say the radical elements of those, of those areas, they wore ski masks. They beat people up. They chased them out of restaurants because they're conservatives. They're rude to them. They shout at them, threaten them, beat them up, show up at their doorsteps and pound their chests and pump their fists. They call themselves things like Antifa, Marxists, communists. They actually fly communist flags. Here in Canada, I don't, I, don't, I don't even know if they're referred to as domestic terrorists, but they sure sound like it. They use fear. Their leaders are, in, are basically in a full-blown war uh, to dissolve things like national sovereignty, the nation-state. Canada will be the first post-national state, according to their leaders. They create division within the citizenry. They uh, support mass immigration from Islamic countries. Only Islamic countries. See, Muslims fled those countries to get away from the, the Islamists. You know, radical Islamists. Muslims fled those countries to get away from them. But now we're bringing them in. Muslims that fled those countries aren't too happy about it. There, this, this ideological war is also being waged on the economy. Wealth distribution to the United Nations. Implementing Sharia law. Nurturing government dependency. Promoting that. Destroying the energy sector. Nationalizing key areas of your federal infrastructure. It's a bit of a bummer, eh? Yeah. But it's real. October 2019 will be the next election in Canada. I recommend you... Think seriously on your choice. Referatur signing out. Hope you're all doing well. And as always, may belief up.